Good morning, Christ United Methodist Church. Welcome to worship. Welcome to um, the third Sunday of Advent. It is good to be back among you after a week of um, laying around and feeling like junk due to COVID. Um, a week of me laying around just about killed me and about drove my wife completely crazy. So thank you to all those who pitched in and helped from Elaine Young who pitched in and helped out in the service and Sam did more than his fair share to Dr. John Seth that filled the pulpit to all you folks that sent us messages and cards and food. I told Sharon at one point, I said, people keep sending us food. I may have to get COVID more often. I could become the only pastor in history that has COVID back to back 17 times in a row. I could get used to this. But no, it was, um, it was wonderful for people. To, it was wonderful to have people taking care of us through all this. We're all back on the mend. The kids, of course, bounced right back. The parents, not quite so much. But it is good to be among you. We want to start with a moment of prayer. We've got a bunch of announcements for you later. But let's start with just a moment of pause. Let's pray. Father, we've gotten here. We've tuned in. We've found our place. Now help us to take a deep breath of your Holy Spirit and to prepare ourselves to enter into your presence, to be reminded of your love and your grace and your mercy that is new every morning, to lift up your name in praise and to give you thanks for all that you have done for us. Thank you, Father, for the way you care. Thank you, Father, for the way you love us. May we honor you this day in song, in action, in thought. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. Welcome, team. Good morning. As we prepare to light the uh, lights of the Advent wreath, let us just begin simply with an act of worship with this chorus, light of the world, you step down into our darkness. Let's sing. Isaiah 9, verse 6 reminds us, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Advent candles are a part of Christian traditions that serve as a reminder that Jesus came as light into our dark world. Two weeks ago, we lit the first candle as a reminder that Christ came as the wonderful counselor. Last week, we lit the second candle as a reminder that Christ came as mighty God, the one who has no equal, and he who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. 
As the Advent candles remind us of the approaching celebration of Jesus' birth, the round wreath symbolizes that God's love is eternal, and its evergreen leaves remind us that God's love is everlasting. The third candle is pink, a color that symbolizes joy. So in lighting this third candle, we do so rejoicing that Jesus came as our everlasting Father. Let us join together as we pray. O oh God, everything we've ever dreamed a father could be, everything we've ever wanted from our relationship with our earthly father, thank you that Jesus came to show that to us. We rejoice that through Jesus, we have a perfect, everlasting father forever. as we continue. Remember, he's an everlasting father. He's great.
Thank you, team. There are some prayer concerns that I want to share with you this morning before we spend some time praying. Um, To begin with, let me share with you that we've been getting encouraging updates all week about Joe Corelli, who's in Presbyterian Hospital. He's now been moved to a rehab unit at Montefiore. Um, He still has a trach mask, but is able to communicate and sit up for periods of time each day and is recovering. So we are grateful to hear that. Uh, be, be holding up Rich and Luann Hart. Um, Rich is back home after spending yet another couple days at Presby, but be praying for them uh, and their daughter who's having some difficult time right now. Uh, Scott Ziegler is struggling with his back um, considerably. He has surgery scheduled Tuesday, so be praying for Scott Ziegler. Tori Burkhart and Anna Burkhart have both lost family members in the last week, Tori lost her aunt Bonnie, and Anna lost her grandfather um, Bob Perry. So be holding up the Burkhart girls. Jane Allen is still in rehab at TCU here at um, Northwest. And yesterday, Sam and I had the privilege of um, officiating at the funeral of uh, Karen Fry. Karen succumbed to lung cancer last week and um, was laid to rest yesterday. Let's not forget the folks who are struggling with the tornadoes that ripped through Friday night, Saturday morning. Um, Incredible devastation. Incredible history-making devastation. And I don't know if you heard this week that three more of the missionaries were released from Haiti. So there's still a bunch being held, but six have been released now. So we want to also pray for that situation. All right? Let's spend a moment in prayer. Father, thank you that you are always, always with us. Whether we are sick or well, whether we are grieving or struggling, whether we are excited or anxious or depressed, your presence never leaves us. Walk with us in this day, Father, that we may be more aware of you in the faces of those around us, in the beauty of creation, in all that is happening in life. We especially, Father, want to lift up to you the tornado victims and and just pray, Lord, that, that those families who have experienced loss, whether it's of loved ones or of property, that they would know in a very real way that your presence is right there with them. Give them grace, Father, as they continue to pick up the pieces of life that are scattered far and wide. Continue to walk, Father, with the missionaries in Haiti. We pray that you would continue to bring that situation to a a rapid and healthy resolution. Move in the hearts of the captors. Move in the power structures that are working on their release. Move and give grace that this may happen soon. Father, thank you for being with Joe as he recovers and with Rich and Luann as they journey together through Rich's struggles. Thank you for being with Scott and getting him a surgery date. Lord, we pray for his doctors and nurses that they would have incredible skill. And that Tuesday's procedure would go easier than they expect. We pray that you be with Tori and Anna as they both grieve losses in their family. May they know your presence is right there. Continue to walk with Jane and with others who are in the hospital and recovering. And be with Karen Fry's family. As they continue to remember, as they continue to care for one another. May these moments together remind them of your great love for them. Now, Father, walk with us as we continue to worship, as we hear from your word. May we see you more clearly today because we spent time in your presence. May we be more aware of you 
tomorrow and throughout this week because we've spent time here today. May this be transformative in our lives. We ask all of this, Father, in your son's precious name, and we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand as we uh, prepare for the messies. Stretch your legs and let us sing. What hope we hold this time and night. A king is born in Bethlehem. Our journey long, we seek the light that leads to the hallowed manger ground. What fear we found. Good morning again, church. Well, some of you are awake. Good. If you have your copy of the scriptures, open them to the second chapter of Luke. We've been working through the birth narrative in chunks. Well, let's put it this way. I was working through it for three weeks. You've been working through it for one. This will be the second week, but eh, we'll catch you up. 
So here again, this story from Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their town to be registered. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the first week we, um, we stopped at the part where Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem and she's expecting a child. And, and we talked a bit about how unique that situation was. Here they are traveling, pregnant, to a town that they really don't want to go to about 90 miles away just so they can pay more taxes. Not an ideal situation. In fact, this struggle of theirs just seems relentless. And yet, in the midst of that struggle, God is at work. He's positioning them in the very town that the prophet some 400 years before, through the prophet Micah, said the Savior would be born in. God is at work in that struggle, bringing his plan to fruition. Well, while they're there, of course, the baby's born. They've been waiting nine months for this birth, and having been a dad four times, I can tell you that um, the nine months seems like a short time to anybody except the mom. And the last month takes about a year and a half, from what I understand. But even though it was a short nine months for Mary to be pregnant, it was a solution that took place in time. A solution that God had been working on since Genesis, since the fall. A a solution that would change salvation history. And in the midst of that, God is at work. You remember the people of Israel in Egypt, they thought God had forgotten all about them. It had been 400 years. And yet God was working to bring about a solution. Could it be that not only is God calling you in your struggle, but that the solution to your struggle takes time? I remember saying to Sharon after we got married, boy, I just so wish that we'd have started dating a year earlier and could have gotten married a year earlier. It would have kept me from being embroiled in some chaos in the year prior to us meeting. And she said, I wasn't ready for you a year ago. (laughs) Well, let's be honest. I'm not sure she was ready for me that year either, but she was brave and took the jump anyway. Today, we want to talk about who God has lined up to begin the process of telling the world about Jesus, about this birth. You know, he's, he's got it all set up, doesn't he? he he's, he's got this wonderful, willing, submissive young virgin to be the mom. He's got this, this dad who is a loving, gracious, caring father who, who cares about Mary and wants to protect her and is willing to be a dad to a son that's not his. It's perfect. He, he has him in the right town, the town that Micah said the birth would happen in. He, he, he's got everything in place. So you just wonder, man, who's, who's he going to use to spread the good news? Maybe, maybe a king like David or a prophet like Isaiah. 
you know? Maybe a wise man like Solomon or, or, or some religious people that really know the word, like the Pharisees or the Sadducees. No. He's got shepherds lined up. Shepherds. Now, now the text doesn't say that these shepherds are particularly unseemly, but, but shepherds of the day? First of all, because of what they did, they could not keep the ceremonial law. So, so they're on the outs with the religious because they're not clean. And they have this annoying habit of confusing mine and thine. In other words, they were noted for reallocating your stuff to their use. You got me? A lot of them were thieves. They were considered an unreliable witness to the point where they were not allowed to give testimony in the law courts just because of their profession. They were a despised class. They were, they were social outcasts. They were shepherds. Not the people that you pick because you want the pinnacle of society. They're shepherds. Why in the world did God announce this birth of, of, of history changing, salvation changing news to these guys, to these ladies? Could it be because they symbolize ordinary people, people like you and people like me, people who have sin issues, people who are just common, everyday people. Sure, they remind us of the beloved King David who was a shepherd before he was king. Sure, they remind us of those who receive the gospel in the future and are then going to go out and pastor people with this message of hope. But they're shepherds. They're a group of people that could use a little more fathering, let's be honest. They could use a father to remind them to be honest. They could use a father that would tell them that they're loved and valued. They could, use, they could use a father that would step in and remind them that they have what it takes and that they're beautiful. Isaiah tells us that one of the titles that will be given to Jesus beside wonderful counselor, mighty God, and prince of peace is everlasting father. Everlasting father. We all had a father someplace. You maybe never met him. But there was a father that contributed half of your genetic material. Some of us had stellar dads. Some of us had dads that did the best they could, even though it was woefully lacking. But in heaven, through the Godhead, we have an ever lasting father not because of gender but because of who he is and what God does for us he speaks into us those important messages that we each need to hear along the road of life as we grow to maturity he reminds us that we're beautiful and worthy of his son dying for us. He reminds us that with his help, we can do whatever he calls us to. We're man enough. We can do this. God chooses shepherds because they're just like you and me. Just like you and me. So if he has shepherds sharing a message, maybe he wants to share a message through you and me. Really? Really? Really. Listen, God can use anyone, but he plans on using us. He has a plan that calls us, like the shepherds, to be heralds. Always and especially at this time of the year. I, I am stunned when I hear stories of little ones 
who don't know anything about Christmas except presents and Santa Claus. And they think that's where it stops. One little boy was in worship with us, heard us talking about God, and afterwards said to his grandma, who's this God? What's that about? Because he'd never heard. Could it be that God really is calling you and me, like the shepherds, to take the message out? After all, we know the story of the baby in the manger, don't we? We know the story of the Savior on the cross of Good Friday, the Savior that is risen from the dead on Easter Sunday. We know about the resident Holy Spirit who, even in the midst of chaos in our lives, gives us a sense that we are not alone. We have a story to tell. We have hope for the world. And why not us? After all, God used Balaam's donkey to deliver a message. I'm sure he can use us if he can use a donkey. And what is the message we have? Well, let's be clear. The message, first and foremost, is of the love and the forgiveness of the babe in the manger that's going to die on the cross for our sins. But, you know, sometimes we need to back up a little bit before we get to that message. When I was in seminary, we had a class called Evangelism. It was probably a 501 or a 601 course at that point in my career. And we had to go out every week for 10 weeks. And once a week, we had to share the gospel with somebody, and we had to write that up and turn it in. So there was a lot of what we referred to as cold turkey evangelism. You know, it's where you just walk up to somebody you don't even know and start sharing the gospel with him. Let me tell you, that is not real effective. It is so much better if you can first develop a relationship and pave a way to gain a hearing. So today I want to give you three suggestions, three messages that I think we need to hear today for today's society so that we can pave a way to tell people about this Christ of the cross, this one who was born in Bethlehem, the one we celebrate, the real reason for this season. First off, I think we need to set aside cynicism in favor of delight. Cynicism is that attitude that that says, I don't trust it, I don't believe it, I, I can find a problem with it. You are looking at one of the most cynical people that you probably know. I drive my wife crazy. We'll be watching a movie, and and she will say to me numerous times, Daryl, it's just a movie. Yeah, honey, but how come the good guys, you hit them once, and they get down, and they stay down? Or the bad guys. And, And the good guys, they, like, are full of bullet holes, and they're still up fighting. Like, these guys never get off the floor. He only punched them. Daryl, it's just a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So since I know that I'm cynical... I've listened to what she has been teaching. My wife has been teaching some of the ladies in our congregation through Jenny Allen. And Jenny Allen says the solution to cynicism is delight. What can I delight in? What can I find, especially in this season, that just brings me delight and joy? Maybe it's the fact that when a Christmas tree blows over in downtown Franklin, somebody has the wherewithal to put up a different one. Maybe it's the lights to bring joy to my heart. Maybe it's the children who are in complete awe of the magnificence of Christmas. Maybe it's the older adults that have recognized just how important family is and how nice it is to have just a few minutes together, even without presents or food, just to visit. Can I delight in that? Can you delight in that? Can you see God doing something around you? Instead of finding fault, instead of questioning motives, just delight. Just rest. Just see God at work. Aside from exchanging cynicism with delight, 
we could exchange some selfishness with some humility. You know, selfishness is all about what I want, what I need, what I believe I deserve. I've been accused of this, but I've said it numerous times. That person's world's about this big around. It's about 18 inches around. Or as one author said, that individual believes that the universal axis revolves around the perpendicular participle. They believe I am the center of the universe. What would it look like this holiday season if we set that aside on occasion and in humility focus on somebody else? Ask them how they're doing and honestly take time to get an answer. Find out what's going on in their life with their children, with their grandchildren. Don't worry if they don't ask you about yours. In humility, just make them the center of the attention for a moment. It may be the first time anybody has given them that opportunity in a very long time. But to do that, we've got to set our selfishness aside. We've got to decide we are not the most important person in the room. We've got to decide it's not all about us. So you've got to go against the world that's been trying to convince you for a long time that it's all about you and you deserve it. And what if we set aside cliches in favor of truth with empathy? Here's what I mean. There are people at this time of year who are struggling with loss. Maybe this is the first Christmas without a loved one. Maybe this is the first Christmas since their divorce. Maybe it's the 50th Christmas since they lost a loved one, but that loss was so significant, they're still struggling with it. In 1985, when I was told that my mom was just diagnosed with stage four brain cancer, a well-meaning friend came up to me with a cliche line. She said to me, she said, what are you worried about? The worst thing that can happen is she'll die. That's exactly what I was worried about. And that thought rocked my world. If you don't know what to say, be like Job's friends for the first seven days. Say nothing. They didn't get in trouble with God till they opened their mouths. And then they tried every cliche line in the book. And that's when God hollered at them. Instead, come at it with empathy. I can't imagine how hard this is. I've had something similar happen, but I'm not in your shoes, so I don't know what it's like for you. I'm just going to be present here with you for a moment. You cannot believe the healing that takes place when you do that. They did a study one time recently um, on therapeutic approaches to psychological problems. And they said, which therapeutic approach works the best? You know what they find out? As long as there's empathy, they all work. Without empathy, none of them work. Empathy is the key. Can I step into your experience and feel with you what's going on? Okay, ladies, close your ears a minute. Guys, if you have heard from your spouse the same story again and again and again, and it's not that you haven't heard her, it's that she hasn't felt, felt. In other words, there's been no empathy. You know the story. But what she really wants is somebody to feel the pain and the loss with her. And when you do, you'll be surprised how quickly there's no more need to tell the story because there's been healing. Empathy is critical for all of us. It's what brings healing and wholeness. You see, when we begin to treat people this way, when, when we, one, express the light because nobody wants to be around cynical people, when we come alongside them with humility and make them the focus for a moment, when we empathize with them, now they're going to know there's something different about you. 
which is going to open that door for you to say, you know, you're going through all this stuff. Are you connecting with God at all? Because when I'm going through this stuff, that's the only thing that gets me through. You realize that that the baby in the manger is the one that died for you? and rose that you could be saved? Do you understand that that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church at Pentecost and it's poured into you when you trust in Christ so that you're never, ever alone? You see, if we start with delight, humility, and empathy, they'll hear us. When we just start out of the gate swinging scripture, they turn us off. Because they're in pain. And they need to know that someone hears their pain first. Then we can offer solutions. There's plenty of pain in our world this Christmas, amen? Every Christmas. I unfortunately needed to hear this sermon because this week I encountered a close relative of mine who... um, was espousing to me a political and practical viewpoint that was not mine. I did not practice the light, humility, and empathy. I told them they were stupid for what they believed. So today, because of this sermon, I need to go contact her and apologize. And I need to come at it from a different side and in humility listen and in empathy struggle with her and see if we can't have a different conversation. It's hard when you feel like you're right, amen? But look, we're not always as right as we think. God alone knows truth. Let's let him be the final authority and let's not think that we've got it all figured out. We're not that good. Let's pray. Father God, give us grace today. As we connect with people in this holiday season, Father, may they see in us a genuine heart of love, a genuine heart that cares for them. And Lord, may they seek you because they see you in our actions. Give us grace, Father. Give us patience. Help us to take our eyes off ourselves and put them on someone else this holiday season and share with them the joy that is Christmas. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand as we reflect on God's word today. We've heard a number of things that are really uh, tools to help us honor God with the way we live our life this season. So let us honor him. Let us give him uh, of ourselves, give him of our hearts. Let's sing this together. This is my desire.
Lord, thank you for your word today that has uh, given us uh, your, your direction and how we may honor you with the way we live our lives and the way we, we share our lives with others. Oh, Lord, help us as we give ourselves to you today and throughout the days of this season. Lord, we want to honor you now with our gifts. We offer our gifts to you as our way of saying thank you. So, Lord, receive these gifts from your people because, Lord, we love you and we want to do all that we can to give our thanks and our honor to you. So bless each gift and giver, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As the ushers uh, prepare to wait upon us, you may be seated and uh, remember to drop your because you count form in the plate as they come by. If you have a prayer request, put it there. And then just a note to say thank you for your ongoing support and those watching. A screen will give you information on how you can give online. And uh, if you're part of another church, we thank you for watching, but we encourage you to support your local church first. Thank you. As we come to our closing moments, let me share with you a couple of announcements uh, in your bulletins. And if you are watching us online or on cable, you should be able to find this on the website. If not, we'll make sure it's up this week. There's an insert that says, um, an evening of Christmas hope is tonight. And at the top, it says this is our December calendar. It gives the special events that are coming up here in December. Um, of important notice is that Christmas Eve, we're going to do three worship services, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock. The 5 o'clock service, the children are going to perform, and most of the seats in-house are going to be for children's families. We're asking you to make reservations, whatever service you're coming to. If you don't have kids in the service uh, at 5 o'clock, you're probably going to need to lean towards 3 or 7 there's a phone number there you can call, a way to get reservations taken care of. Please be aware of that, and please notice that the Sunday after Christmas, we're doing one worship service, 10 o'clock. We're going to do it for the next three years. This year, the Sunday after Christmas is the day after Christmas. Next year, it's Christmas Day. The year after that, it's Christmas Eve. So just pay attention to that. If you can help us out around Christmas time, we're looking for ushers for Christmas Eve and a pianist for the 9:35 and 11 service. On occasion, some folks to sing in the praise team. Use the Because You Count sheet to let us know that. Um, we sent out a year-end letter about the pastor's discretionary fund by email. If you did not get it, there are copies on the information desk. Be sure you pick one up. If you're available at noon and you're still here at church, Hey, we're going to move that piano to this spot. That takes like about 100 people. Not quite, but Kim can't do it by herself. Let's put it that way. So we could use some help doing that, all right? Um, tonight is our evening of Christmas hope. We would really hope to do that live and invite you guys back. But with the numbers of COVID, we did not think it was responsible to stuff this place with a couple hundred folk at 3 and at 7, so it's going to be recorded this afternoon, and it'll air tonight at 7 o'clock on the cable channel or on our YouTube channel, so be sure you tune into that, and information on how to do that is on that insert. Um, if you go to our website and you hit the watch live button at 7 o'clock tonight, it'll be there. Yes, yes Nick? Okay. And uh, you'll be able to watch it. It'll be, it looks a lot better over the internet than it does on cable. Trust me on that. Okay. This is the last Sunday for the um, hats, scarves, gloves, mitten tree. 
So if you have any, get them to us ASAP. And a huge thank you to Lloyd and Holly Rogers from Awesome Soup that went out of here last week. We got some at our house, and I want to talk to them about recipes. Man, was it good. I've been eating some of it all week. Wonderful soup. Uh, what else? I think that's it. Everything else is in your bulletin. Um, pay attention to the date for Art of Parenting on January 8th. Would you stand with me as we sing our way out? peace and may the peace of Christ go with you. Amen.